yeah, the title of this talk was Particle Physics Buffet. The idea that I had in mind was, um, you know, research is this kind of bubbly thing. There's always things happening. And I would pick out two or three topical pieces of news and talk about them, right? Kind of like journalism. So a very topical thing is uh, at the Atlas experiment at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, uh, studying particle collisions at the highest energies ever. Um, <clears throat> there was recorded recently this collision, which is the highest energy collision at the LHC ever and is the highest energy collision ever recorded in a controlled way. Wow, that's kind of topical, I thought. That will, that will be one of my topics. Um, and then, you know, as it turned out, <clears throat> instead of writing a newspaper article, I put together a magazine article. <clears throat> and so I'm going to talk about the quest to observe phenomena at higher energies as my only topic. I'm sorry, the buffet turned into a kind of large <laughs> meal. Uh, <clears throat> I hope, you know, like large meals, I hope we're not all asleep at the end. <laughs> <clears throat> so, it turns out the reason we want to go to higher energies is that is the way to study small things. <clears throat> and the study of small things is kind of a theme in science that goes all the way back to the Greeks. Right. The idea that we can explain the world by breaking it down into smaller things. Right. Now, of course, in the 20th century, we, we have a profound expression of this, the atomic hypothesis that actually goes all the way back to the Greeks. Um, but, you know, it's not just about atoms. It's a general way of looking at things. Uh, you know, in the horrible biology class in high school, you know, you unzip the frog and you look inside and you see the frog is built of these smaller parts that all add together in a kind of a mechanism that makes the frog, right? So we understand, we can understand how things work generally, right? By looking inside and understanding the mechanism. So the, world, the word for this, as you know, is reductionism. <clears throat> in general, understanding things in the world by breaking them down into their parts. Uh, in physics, as I said, the highly successful expression of this is uh, the atomic theory. <clears throat> Those small things, uh, which in fact are made of even smaller things, right? Mm -hmm. Things that are so small you can't see them with your eye, you can't see it with a microscope. Right? And so one question, uh, a tactical question, a tactical scientific question is how, how do you even know? How do you look at these smaller things that you can't see? Right? <clears throat> and then once you see them and you know their size, how small are they really? What's, what, what is that size scale? And then what are those things made of? So this is the theme of today's meal. Here's how to get some information about atoms. In fact, here's uh, uh, an empirical observation whose interpretation was one of the earliest evidences for the existence of atoms. You're looking at here a drop of water under a microscope and suspended in the drop of water are two, are, are latex spheres that are two microns in diameter. Mm -hmm. uh, one micron in radius, that's the black things, okay. And you, you see the way they're jiggling around? Okay. We're looking at the dance of these objects that are one micron in radius. That's pretty small, we can, but we can still see them under a microscope. But, but, but how small are we talking about? One micron, we're starting at one micron, okay? 
So we're going to talk about mm, size scales and a way to intuit the size scales using a technique, maybe many of you are familiar with this, it's called powers of 10. <clears throat> let's, just, let's just imagine mm -mm -mm, our, our, uh, our comparisons simply in terms of powers of 10. So, in fact, in this talk, kind of the level of precision of anything that I'm going to say is really limited to a factor of 10. Sometimes I'll be off by a factor of 2 or a factor of 5. That error is not important. We're just trying to get a sense of the size of things, right, in terms of sort of s s s s s s simple arithmetic. <clears throat> simple arithmetic based on powers of 10. So the spheres are one micron. A micron is a millionth of a meter. That is a 10,000th of a centimeter. That's a one with four zeros in front of it, right? And it's expressed, as expressed succinctly in scientific notation. The way you write this is 10 to the minus four centimeters. That's the size of those spheres. So let's start by just getting an idea of how small those spheres are. 10 to the minus four centimeters. How, how, how do we picture the size of that? Well, let's zoom in so that one of those spheres is a centimeter in size. All right? <clears throat> uh, so if I put, if I have one of those spheres at an end, at the end of a one centimeter marker, right, and I zoom in so that the sphere looks like it's a centimeter large, <clears throat> In the zoom, the other end of the marker is going to move away from me. How far does it go? Well, it's going to go a factor of 10 to the fourth away. 10 to the fourth centimeters, oops, sorry. 10 to the fourth centimeters is 100 meters. It's about 100 yards. Okay, so <clears throat> if that one micron sphere was a centimeter, the other end of the centimeter is at the goalposts on the other side of the football field. Okay. That's one micron. Okay, that's the size of our spheres. So that's pretty small already. And here they are suspended in water, jiggling around like this. This was first observed by uh, the famous botanist at the time, in, uh, Robert Brown in 1984, was looking at pollen suspended in water and uh, under a microscope, um, and one of the pollen, one of the pollen uh, particles popped open, and smaller particles came out. And he saw those particles dancing around like this. He thought that he had discovered the vital force that animates <laughs> all life. Right? It's, it's, you know, that's just 200 years ago. It's it's kind of incredible to think that you know people were still thinking that way, the vital force. Uh, but he was a good scientist, and so to test that, he suspended soot particles in water and discovered that the inanimate soot particles behaved in the same way. So something else is going on here to jostle these particles around. Right? And this was understood, um, go to slide. This was understood by, guess who? Albert Einstein, <clears throat> in 1905, wrote a famous paper interpreting the motion of the micron spheres, in our case, right, as, as, uh, as being buffeted on all sides by the atoms in the material they were suspended in. Right? So think of it this way. This thing is surrounded by a huge number of these small atoms, and the atoms <clears throat> are doing their atomic dance because of the thermal energy. The atoms have energies that actually are proportional to the temperature. <clears throat> so this thing is in this swarm of atoms being buffeted on all sides. Um, and, you know, if the same number of atoms in the same instant hit it on both sides, it doesn't move. But if slightly more atoms hit it on one side than another side, because of the statistical randomness in the thing, then it gets a little kick and moves. 
right? <clears throat> and performs this kind of uh, random walk. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Einstein um, interpreted and had a prediction that the distance that the thing traveled would go like the square root of the time in this theory, right? And careful experiments by Perrin a few years later confirmed Einstein's theory. And this was then the first, one of the first evidences that there really were atoms. A thing that, you know, lots of people didn't believe at the time. Um, <clears throat> and this inferential experiment, you can't see them, right? <clears throat> but you can devise a theory that explains something you can see, right? And from that infer the existence of the atoms. There really are atoms. And the other great power of Einstein's theory was uh, <clears throat> that from the rate of motion, one could calculate uh, a very famous hitherto uncalculable number, which was the number of atoms in a cubic centimeter of stuff. Right? This number is called, um, oops, this number is called Avogadro's number. It was Avogadro in, uh, 1810 or so, who had the hypothesis, the simple hypothesis, that the number of atoms is proportional to the volume in, in a gas, says theory. From Einstein's theory was, uh, of Brownian motion, it was possible to calculate Avogadro's number. Six times 10 to the 23 atoms in a cubic centimeter, kind of more or less. That's a six with 23 zeros after it, right? An unthinkably huge number. From that number and from the idea that mm, in a cubic centimeter, the atoms might just be packed next to each other in there, right? you calculate the size of the atom. We've got it. The atom has a size of 10 to the minus eight centimeters, right? So it's, Remember, the sphere is 10 to the minus 4 centimeters, so the atom is 10,000 times smaller than the sphere. How small is that? <laughs> let's, let's use now our sort of power of 10 zoom technique. <clears throat> oh, no, before we get to that, sorry. Uh, we know the atoms are 10 to the minus 8 centimeters, right? <clears throat> Here's kind of what we know now. Now, this is kind of leaping ahead in the history of things. It's a picture of the surface of graphite made with a scanning tunneling microscope with atomic resolution, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and there they are. The atoms look like little balls. <clears throat> and we know that they are 10 to the minus 8 centimeters apart. Okay. Now, what is 10 to the minus 8 centimeters? <clears throat> well, now let's do our trick again. Okay. Imagine that we put, <clears throat> imagine that we have our centimeter marker and we put the atom, we put one atom at one side of that thing. And then we zoom in so that the atom is one centimeter in radius. Where does the other side of the marker go? Okay. Well, it's going to go, we're zooming in by a factor of 10 to the eighth. So the other side of the marker is the 10 to the 8th centimeters, which is 1,000 kilometers, which is 600 miles, which is in New York. Okay, so to picture the size of the atom, right, <clears throat> imagine, you know, laying out a ruler from here to New York and lining along the ruler marbles like this, all right. <clears throat> That's the size of the atom compared to a centimeter, right? We're looking pretty small. Uh, now, this picture that I showed you, it's like a, a surface of atoms, right? Mm -hmm. So, 
let's make a square centimeter with our 10 to the eighth zoom. So we go from New York and down to Cape Hatteras up to Knoxville, right? Okay, and now carpet this thing with atoms, right? <clears throat> then you have the, 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 the zoom version of this, but, but why stop there? <laughs> let's, make, let's make a cube. Let's make a zoomed version of a cubic centimeter, right? So on our square, which is 600 miles square, Oops. Um, let's make a box that's also 600 miles high. 600 miles high. Now the International Space Station is 250 miles high, so you got to go more than twice as high as the space station, right? <clears throat> and now we have an idea of what Avogadro's number is, because if you fill this box. 600 miles square with marbles like this. Okay, you'll have 10 to the eighth on a side and the cube of that is 10 to the 24th. So think of filling that box with marbles like this and that's how many atoms are in here. Okay. That's our first measure of something pretty small. Well then, <clears throat> we know atoms exist, science proceeds, um, <clears throat> and actually before even Einstein, you know, Mendeleev had put this picture together, uh, this, this organized way to think about the different properties of the atoms, um, seeing that all the guys in this column all had the same properties and all the noble gases here have the same properties. So there's all these different kinds of atoms. Uh, and the different kinds of atoms are uh, responsible for the different kinds of chemical properties. We're explaining the world by breaking it into smaller parts, right? And uh, thanks to Einstein, we know they exist. Right? And we can talk about them like the real things. But Oh my goodness, there's all these different kinds of atoms now. Um, and all we can see, even now, with our most sophisticated kind of microscopes, is they look like a bunch of little balls. <clears throat> featureless balls. But they can't be featureless because there's all these different kinds. This, of course, as you know, can be understood by breaking the atom down into smaller parts, right? And seeing that this pattern is due to the different arrangements of the smaller parts, right? Different numbers of protons and neutrons. <clears throat> In our historical summary, Right. We might say that the first clue of this uh, came from the work of J.J. Thompson, 1897, uh, using evacuated glass cylinders um, <clears throat> and uh, electrodes, uh, using voltages on the order of hundreds of volts or so, um, pulling the charged object out of the atom, right? studying the electron. Uh, the thing that he called at the time a cathode ray, revealing the existence of this particle that was apparently one part of the atom, much smaller and lighter, the electron. So then we knew at that point, they knew, right, that there were smaller things in there, right? And our reductionist scheme of understanding by breaking down into smaller parts could proceed. <clears throat> the great leap forward, oh, sorry. And then there is another mystery part, mystery internal uh, part of the atom, um, which was high energy particles s seeming to come out of the atom as if they're being created in there and emerging. And can we get the cloud chamber?
so here's an example. <clears throat> uh, so for this, there's a welding rod containing radioactive thorium. Uh, and the rod, it's over here in this, in this little vessel. With the bubbler here, the bubbler is 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 a chiller to cool down uh, alcohol vapor. So this thing is in a super saturated atmosphere of alcohol vapor, and when the vapor is disturbed, like say by a microscopic particle going through it at high energy, uh, a vapor trail is left behind. It's exactly the same phenomenon as the airplane flying through the upper atmosphere, leaving a vapor trail, disturbing the, disturbing the atmosphere uh, so that it condenses. Um, same thing happens here. Okay. So we're looking at high energy particles emanating from <clears throat> this thorium rod. Right. Uh, these are mostly particles that, uh, we call alpha particles. They're uh, kind of a bare helium nucleus, right? um, traveling at high energies. These can be a probe now to look inside the featureless ball. Um, go back to slides. So here would be the trick, right? Here's another version of this cloud chamber looking at the trajectory of an alpha particle. Uh, and you see in this example, it looks like the alpha particle collided with something right here. Um, and as a result of that collision, the direction of its motion was changed. And whatever it collided with actually traveled a little distance here. See that small dot? So around 1908 or so, uh, Ernest Rutherford uh, and Hans Geiger got the idea that um, we could use these radioactive particles maybe to probe into the atom, right? direct the particles into the atom, right? and look at the directions at which they're, the angles through which they're scattering, right? and see if we can derive some information about the interior of the atom in that way. So here's the experimental uh, idea. It is collimate these alpha particles and direct them at a gold foil. Right? <clears throat> uh, and the alpha particles will collide with atoms or maybe the interior of the atoms. Right? And we will measure the the trajectory of the outgoing alpha particle by letting it collide with a fluorescent screen, zinc sulfide. When the alpha particle collides with the screen, there would be a microscopic dot of light. Right? So, you know, in this uh, uh, in this picture, it's shown schematically as if you could put the fluorescent screen around the whole thing. Um, the way Geiger uh, and Marsden and Rutherford did it was with this apparatus. Um, this is it's kind of that big. It's an evacuated cylinder. They pump the air out of it. Um, the alpha source is in this block. The gold foil is here. Um, and then this is a microscope with the phosphor, with the zinc sulfide at the end. And so the graduate student, Marsden, would look through the microscope and count the number of fluorescences that he would see. Uh, and then the microscope could be swung around so that he could count the number of fluorescences as a function of the angle. Okay. <clears throat> Actually, um, the story is that Geiger had this new student, Marsden, and he wasn't, didn't have a project for him. And so he asked his boss, Rutherford, got any ideas? And Rutherford said, I've got this crazy idea that maybe some particles would come out of this collision at very high angles. Why don't you have Marsden look at that? It was like a crazy idea to give a new student because they couldn't think of anything better. 
<laughs> right. And to their shock and surprise, they saw particles coming out at very large angles, as particles being scattered through very large angles. They expected the stuff to go right through, and most of it did, but a small number of particles came out at very large angles. Here's why they were surprised, and, 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 and the ultimate interpretation is it was after Thomson discovered the electron, he got this idea that um, the atom, the positive part of the atom was this kind of big puffy thing, and the electrons were kind of embedded in there. Therefore, the distribution of positive charge was spread out over a large area. And when the positively charged alpha particles went through that, they would see this kind of cloud, soft cloud, this like not very dense cloud of charge and pass right through. If something scattered out at very large angles, it had to be because the positive charge was concentrated in a very small volume. <clears throat> that is, there was some very small positively charged thing at the center of the atom. I want to show a technical version of this because this is going to um, turn into a theme for the rest of this talk. Um, so uh, this is from Hertel at the Max Born Institute for Nonlinear Optics. <clears throat> This is a plot of angles observed in Rutherford scattering. Uh, so think of this as this axis as the number that are observed to scatter through some angle. Right? And this is in powers of 10. Right? The green curve is the prediction from the Thomson theory. And the red curve is what is, is, what is observed. Right? So some number of particles scattering through 100 degrees, okay, where the other theory predicts nothing. <clears throat> the implication is that there's something very small and dense at the center of the atom. Rutherford called, worked out the theory and called it the nucleus. And the size of the nucleus that you infer from this is 10 to the minus 13 centimeters, okay, another 100,000 times smaller than the atom. Okay. How small is that? <laughs> All right. OK. Well, leaving aside the comparison to a centimeter, let's just think about how much smaller. I mean, we've, we've already settled on that. We're kind of familiar now with the size of the atom, right? right? One of these compared to the distance to New York. All right. Okay, now we're going to be 100,000 times smaller into that. So let's do our powers of 10 zoom trick again. <clears throat> Start from the picture. Actually, before the zoom trick, the picture, this is our cartoon idea of the atom, right? Everyone knows this picture. Okay. But the nucleus is a hundred thousand times smaller than the atom. So if you're looking at the atom like this, it's, you can't see the nucleus. It's so small. Okay. And now, sorry, our power of 10 zoom trick. <clears throat> if the nucleus is this one centimeter marble here in the Denison building, as we used to call it, the electrons are a factor of are 10,000 or 100,000 centimeters away, right? The electrons are 100,000 centimeters. That's one kilometer. They're one kilometer away at the library. Okay. Looking inside the atom now, think about this. This is the nucleus. And everybody knows the electrons are in orbit around the nucleus, right? This is the nucleus, and the electron orbit is out at the library. Okay. Well, think of the interior of this spherical atom, right, where the radius of that thing is from here to the library. Right. This atom is an empty, empty thing, right? <clears throat> 
in the in this picture the atoms are dense packed right? and the electrostatic repulsion between the electrons keeps them apart from each other makes everything solid like that right right but inside the atoms there's nothing right the nucleus is here and the electrons are at the library. Empty. Okay. <clears throat> when your Eastern mystic guide tells you that gold and wealth is an empty pursuit, right? <laughs> he's telling the truth. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> there we are at the nucleus. <clears throat> Oh, the nucleus is made of protons and neutrons. What holds them together in there? This is another thing to be explored, right? And um, <clears throat> the exploration of that revealed that there are many other kinds of particles like the proton and the neutron. We're kind of up to the 50s or early 60s now. Oh no, another layer of stuff. Now down at 10 to the minus 13 centimeters, particles called hadrons, um, the neutron and the proton and the sigma baryons and the cascade baryons, those were all spin half. And then it was discovered that there's a spin zero version of this thing, the pions and the kaons. It's kind of like another version now of the periodic table. So you might have thought we're down to the smaller things, but look, there's a proliferation of these things now. Uh, and the way we would understand a proliferation, the way we would understand a pattern is by hypothesizing that these are made of still smaller things. <clears throat> so in the early 60s, Gelman and Zweig independently suggested a theory which could account for all this if the proton and the neutron and all of its cousins here were made of smaller things called quarks. <clears throat> the quarks, uh, there would be, there were only three quarks, right? And from the various arrangements of the three quarks, one could build up all these particles. So it has this kind of attractiveness now of the uh, you know, the reductionist scheme. Oh, we've got all these hundreds of particles now. Um, Fermi said, all these particles, if I could remember the names of them, I'd be a botanist. <laughs> okay, okay. No offense to botanists. <clears throat> Botany again, right? Because Brown was a botanist, right? So it's, it's all connected, yeah. all right? Um, uh, uh, and Gelman and Zweig could explain all this as just the different arrangements of three things. That's pretty attractive. Um, in their theory, the three things called quarks would have to have fractional charge. Oh, that's a tough pill to swallow. Um, and furthermore, uh, after expensive, uh, I'm sorry, after extensive theoretical effort, no one could see any sign of anything with a fractional charge. Right. <clears throat> Um, as if um, these quarks, actually, e even Gelman thought as if these quarks were a kind of a theoretical construct that could explain this, but kind of were mathematical only, couldn't be real, kind of like string theory. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Okay, well, well <clears throat> how now are we going to look inside of these things at 10 to the minus 13 centimeters? It turns out this can be done by repeating Rutherford's trick. Um, <clears throat> here's the reason. Um, that alpha particle that Rutherford sent into the atom to see the nucleus, right, discussed quantum mechanically is a wave. <clears throat> um, and if you want to illuminate something with waves, 
uh, you have to make sure that the size of the wavelength is smaller than the feature you want to see. Which means if you go to smaller wavelengths, you can see smaller features, right? Now let me just show you about um, the size of the wavelength and the size of the feature. So, so could we go to Ripple Tank? If you ever took an introductory physics class, you remember falling asleep during this. <laughs> right? So it's a shallow pool of water, and hanging in the pool is um, this, this metal plate. Um, and um, um, acoustically, the plate is me being made to vibrate, and that's making waves in the water. All right? And the waves are impinging now on a pair of um, metal blocks, a pair of aluminum blocks. Uh, and I'm going to move one block away from the other block. And now you can see, you can't see the blocks, you can't see the shadow of the blocks, unfortunately, but you can see that I just made a slit in the block. Right? And you can see <clears throat> the wave here passing through the slit. Right? Now, oh, you can see the block there, right? Thank you guys, right? You can see the block, okay? Now watch <clears throat> as I move the blocks closer together. You can still see, you can see that the blocks are not touching, right? Actually, I have a light here. See there, the blocks are not touching, right? But you can't see the wave anymore going through the slit because the size of the slit has become smaller than the wavelength, right? And so this big wave is passing by, and the slit's kind of too small compared to the wave, right? For the wave to see it. Right? <clears throat> In order to see this feature, the wavelength has to be s comparable or smaller to the size of the feature. Now, I can't change the wavelength there, but I can change the size of the feature. Right? So it's comparable to the size of the wave, and now you can see the diffraction pattern from the wave going through the slit. So if you can make the wave s smaller than or comparable, if you can make the wavelength, which is the distance between the crests, if you can make the wavelength smaller than the size of the feature, you can illuminate the feature. OK, back to slides. <clears throat> oh, turn off the buzz. OK. All right, well, how do we make the wavelength smaller for our quantum mechanical wave? Easy. <clears throat> Einstein, in his famous paper on the photoelectric effect, told us that the wave, the, the, that considering, if this was about light, but it's true for matter, considering things quantum mechanically, the wavelength goes like the inverse of the energy. So if you raise the energy of your probe, the wavelength goes down and you can see smaller features. Incidentally, this paper in 1905 is the same year as he wrote his paper about Brownian motion. And it's the same year as the paper about special relativity. Remember when you were in school, you, you, you were good at something, you know, you were the best, like, like at, the, at the high jump or the violin or maybe at math, right? And then in February, this new kid came into the class. <laughs> and not only were they better than you at the violin, they were better at the high jump and better at math, right? <laughs> That's Einstein, okay? <laughs> Unbelievable. What a year. <clears throat> Higher energy probes smaller distance. Okay, let's go back to our, uh, uh, oh, let's, let's start making a table. Okay, so here's where we've gotten so far. Oh, I'm going to have to go faster. <clears throat> the atom is 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. And it turns out in Thomson's experiment, ripping electrons out of atoms, he's probing that with, an, with uh, uh, electrons falling through a potential of a volt. We call that an energy of an electron volt. Okay. 
Rutherford's alpha particle was 5 million electron volts. We're just going to deal with powers of 10, so we're just going to call it a million electron volts, an, a mega EV, an MEV. <clears throat> and we got down, to, with that probe, we could see 10 to the minus, we could see the nucleus at 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. Okay. We want to see smaller. Could we increase the energy by a factor of 1,000? I mean, Rutherford had to just work with alpha particles coming out of the nucleus, but now by technological, clever, artificial means, we can raise the energy by a factor of 1,000 in an accelerator. <clears throat> and here's the important accelerator in this step of the story. It's the Stanford Linear Accelerator. Uh, this was built in the 60s, exploiting actually uh, RF klystron technology that had been invented to, to power radar in World War II. <clears throat> and so those klystrons generating huge electromagnetic fields could all be put in a two mile long row an electron starting at this end gets accelerated that, through that thing, right? And at this end, it comes out of the pipe at 20 billion, 20 giga electron volts, right? And is directed into this building, famous M station A, right? And in that building is this device called a magnetic spectrometer. Um, <clears throat> The beam hits a target and then is directed through these magnets. And the amount of bending in the magnet allows you to measure the energy of the particle coming off of the target. Right? And then in this box is a technique for uh, distinguishing that you actually have scattered electrons and not some other source of background. Right? You know, these big things, here's the human, right? And this is, this is late 60s. This is actually kind of uh, um, retro. Okay. Um, now, you see these rails here, right? This, as if this thing slides on these rails. I want to show you, I want to emphasize that in this next picture. Here's the schematic of the experiment. <clears throat> the beam comes in, strikes the target, goes through this large apparatus, set at some fixed angle, right? And you measure the energy, right? And then you can slide this thing around and you can measure the amount of particles scattered through a given angle. So it's exactly Rutherford's experiment, right? Repeated at a thousand times the energy, right? With the sort of technology scaled up to be able to study that. Okay. Same trick. <clears throat> here's, uh, <clears throat> here's a plot of the momentum transferred to the target, whatever it was striking in the target. This is as a function of the momentum transferred, but we could think of this almost as the angle. Here is the prediction of the theory, thinking of the proton, of the proton <clears throat> as a kind of a mushy thing, kind of like Thompson's version of the atom. Right? And what is observed is uh, a large number of particles basically scattering at larger angles, just like Rutherford's result, right? which told us then that there is something smaller inside the proton that the electrons were scattering off of. Right? This was the confirmation of the existence of quarks inside the proton right? <clears throat> at 10, well, and the size of the quark, not that the thing was really that big, but you know, what it, you could tell how much smaller it was than the proton, right? So it's 100 times smaller than the proton, right? So the quark is as if its size is 10 to the minus 15 centimeters. Now we're down there. Are we done yet? <laughs> no. Further studies at accelerators reveal that there's a whole family of quarks. There's the up and the down quark that make the proton and the neutron. 
Uh, and then there's um, two more sets of those guys uh, that make other hadronic particles, and some don't make those particles at all. And in the standard model of particle physics, right, the quarks are partnered with the lighter particles called the leptons. Right? Now we have, and, and uh, the, you know, here's the familiar electron, is kind of the same kind of thing now we understand as the quarks. And the electron, like the quarks, has its heavier cousins, the muon and the tau, and here's the neutrinos. And oh, you see, we thought we were down to the quarks and we were at the lowest level. But now there's a bunch of, there's 12 different things like those. Right? In the reductionist scheme, you might think we could explain these 12 different things as somehow combinations of some smaller things that are inside. Can we see the smaller things that are inside? Well, we know the trick to use now. Right. We, went, uh, we used an accelerator to go up by a fact, to increase the energy by a factor of 1,000, decrease the wavelength so we could see the smaller feature. Let's build another accelerator to go up by another factor of 1,000 and collide the quarks. Right. And that thing, as you know, is the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, <clears throat> a tunnel underground tw tunnel, 27 kilometers around, filled with bending magnets to steer the protons, right, and radio frequency cavities, klystrons to accelerate the protons, so that at a couple of places around this ring, um, most importantly for Michigan here at the ATLAS experiment, protons collide against protons at 6.5 trillion electron volts per beam, right? Another factor of thousand, factor of a thousand higher in energy, in principle probing to a factor of, of a thousand smaller in distance scale. How do we study those collisions with an apparatus the size of this building? The Atlas detector, right? Here are the humans for scale. Right, the beams pass through the center of this thing and collide there. And then surrounding the collision point, this is the most highly instrumented point in the universe, well, in the world. <laughs> we don't know, right? So surrounding the collision point are electronic detectors that record the, in, it's the part, it's, in the collisions, stuff comes out, and the electronic detectors record the trajectories and the energies of the particles that emerge. Now, when the quarks collide in there, <clears throat> some of the time they collide in a way where they're ejected out at right angles to the beam. That's what the detector's for. And here's the reason no one saw quarks before. The, the strong interaction that holds the quarks in the proton, unlike gravity and electromagnetism, grows stronger with the distance between the quarks. So as the quarks move apart from each other, <clears throat> the force, strong force field between them grows stronger until there's enough energy contained in there to create another pair of pair of quark, another pair of quark and antiquark. So as these things pull apart from each other, quarks and antiquarks start being ripped from the bat from the vacuum, if you like, created from the vacuum. And those quarks all follow the direction of the original quark and combine into those pions and kaons that you saw in the earlier slide. So when you look at what when you look in the detector Here's, this is what you see, right? Here is the imaging part of the detector uh, showing us the, tra the trajectories of these par particles streaming out. And out here is uh, the calorimetric measurement, the destructive measurement where we absorb the energies of the particle and just measure their energies and represent that here by a histogram. These, this jet, as it's called, of particles streaming out from 
the center represents here in the big world the 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 original scattered quark with its original momentum right that then is said to fragment into all of these other quarks um, and appear in this way so you can't get a free quark out that's why no one could see them before um, <clears throat> Um, but if you pull them apart from each other, you can create the, 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 the quark. The quark causes other quarks to pop out of the vacuum and make this spray of particles called the jet. And you have to think of this thing, you know, the size of the house or size of a house. You have to think of that pointing back to 10 to the minus 13 centimeters, right? Way in there. Now we've become more sophisticated in our graphics. <clears throat> and to represent the most energetic collision ever recorded. Right now we have this cool way to show it. Right? Uh, so here we are in, in, oops, sorry, inside the detector. Right? The beams come in like this. Here was the collision. Here's the visualization of the trajectory of the particles. And this is a visualization of the energy of the particles uh, as they hit the calorimeter. <clears throat> this collision has nine TeV in the center of mass, it is the highest energy controlled particle collision ever made. Right? It's the highest energy one that we've got. Right? And it is <clears throat> kind of off of the edge of this graph, which is the third version of this graph showing the same thing again, repeating Rutherford's trick. You could think of this axis as the number of particles. <clears throat> this axis is related again to the momentum transfer. You can think of it as the scattering angle. Right. Um, this plot was made in the building next door by postdoc Ryan Edgar and graduate student Karishma Sakan in the UM Atlas group. Right. And we were really kind of tickled about the fact that we were following right in Rutherford's footsteps, right, to do this version now exploring the smallest distance scales ever. <clears throat> that event that I showed you, which is way out here off the graph, representing the collision at 9 TeV, if we turn the energy into the wavelength and the equivalent distance that we're exploring, it's 10 to the minus 18 centimeters, right? 100,000 times smaller than the proton. So remember about the nucleus being here and the electrons being at the library? Okay. Now the quarks are here and the, outs the outside of the proton is at the library. Okay. And we're in there looking at the quarks. Right. Now, the proton is not empty like the atom is. The proton is this swirling relativistic quantum field erupting particle, antiparticle stew. <clears throat> um, but we're looking inside there, 100,000 times smaller. And look, here's the bad news. Um, oops, the bad news is we do not see. Um, particles departing, we do not see scattering events departing from the curve. We are not seeing anything inside the quarks at this level. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> there is no evidence for the internal structure of the quarks. As far as we can tell at this point, they are just, this point, they are just points. Well, okay, I'm comparing here to the size of the proton, and then we're going to compare to the size of the atom. But one more try with our power of 10 thing. Let's compare it to the size of a centimeter. Right? We are looking at 10 to the minus 18 centimeters. So if we put one of those quarks at one end of our centimeter marker, right, and zoom in until the quark was this big, this is the limit. It's probably smaller than this. Right? Where would the other side of the marker be? Right? It would be at 
10 to the eighth, 10 to the 18th centimeters, which is a light year away. Okay, one quarter of the distance to the closest star. Right. So compare this to the one quarter of the distance to the closest star. Right. That's a quark to one centimeter. That is a heck of a microscope. Okay, and you should think of it that way. You know, accelerators, particles, Higgs bosons, all these kind of new kind of frostings on the cake. Yes, but another way to look at this is this is a microscope probing the smallest distances ever explored. How are we doing? Mm, I'm almost done. Uh, I, I saved a demo because I thought at this point, after an hour, wake up. OK, I saved a demo. This one actually goes with the Brownian motion um, experiment. So remember the latex spheres, right? And the atoms are hitting the latex spheres and making the latex sphere move around. Really, you're thinking, really, you know, a few atoms more or less on one side of the other can make the thing move, really? Well, here's, here's, here's a demonstration. What if we took all of the atoms away from one side? So the other side was subject to the atomic collisions, and there was nothing to balance it on the other side. That's set up here, so pipe, um, the two ends of the pipe are sealed with um, freezer paper, parchment paper with wax on one side so we can close the vise on this thing and it's uh, airtight. And on one side of the paper here, there's a ping pong ball. <clears throat> Since it's airtight, I can pump the air out of the thing and then we'll have vacuum on one side of the ping pong ball in the atmosphere on the other. Let's get it going. Now, one way to think about this is, oh, there'll be a vacuum in there, you know, and the air will rush into the vacuum, right? But what does it mean for the air to rush in? The air doesn't know. Yeah. The air here doesn't know that there's a vacuum in here and it should rush in there. Actually, what's happening here is the molecules of the air are in thermal motion doing their thing. 10 to the 23rd of them, right? And <clears throat> when I break the piece of parchment paper here with my razor blade hammer, uh, the 10 to the 23rd atoms will hit the ping pong ball without 10 to the 23rd atoms on this side to balance it. Ready? <laughs> Three, two, one. <laughs> okay. So the... Um, the motion arrester was this Coke can. Whoa. The air molecules in thermal motion around us, they're moving at the speed of sound. That's why sound has that velocity. It's the velocity of the air molecule. So when I punctured this thing, 10 to the 23rd air molecules hit that thing at the speed of sound. And this is the first time you've seen a ping pong ball approach the speed of sound. Okay. Saw it here, Saturday morning physics. Okay. Now wait, I'm not done. I'm not done. I need, I need two more minutes. I need two more minutes. Right. Where were we? Before our pyrotechnic uh, wake up. Okay. Here's where we are. This is the history of the probe of smaller distance scales in the 20th century. Right. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> at Rutherford's 1 MeV experiment, 
reveal the nucleus at 10 to the minus 13 centimeters, right? Uh, the SLAC experiment revealed quarks at 10 to the minus 15 centimeters, but that's showing us that there's something inside the proton. Um, and the quarks themselves are fermions, which we have now probed at 10 to the minus 18 centimeters with no sign yet of internal structure. <clears throat> We're left now with this scientific puzzle, right? Here's this all, here's these 12 fermions with uh, kind of a, these you need to make the world, and this is a needless repetition of that. There must be some explanation of this structure. We haven't seen if there's anything inside to explain this. So <clears throat> we could keep doing this. How low could we go? Well, yeah, the ultimate is the length scale where gravity meets quantum mechanics. Uh, a length scale that you can construct using purely dimensional analysis. Combine the fundamental constants of gravity and quantum mechanics to make a length. And you get this thing called the Planck length. It's at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. This is a comprehensible scientific prediction for what might be the smallest length scale. Right. <clears throat> it's another 15 powers of 10 down. Maybe somewhere along the way down there, we could understand what's inside the quarks. Maybe not. And so we're left with a conundrum, right? which brings us back finally to the elements of our menu, right? <clears throat> we started with an eternal question. Can we understand nature by breaking it into smaller parts? Right? <clears throat> we found that we could apply that right? and got down to sort of the contemporary version of this. That's the recent news. Uh, highest energy collisions at the LHC are exploring 10 to the minus 18 centimeters. Um, and the, Fermi, the fermions still seem like points. So we're left with these puzzles. What does explain the properties of those fermions? And given that it might be difficult to keep building accelerators to keep repeating Rutherford's trick, how will we proceed? If human ingenuity, mathematical and theoretical ingenuity, can predict that there are some way smaller length scales, right? it is the challenge for us now experimentally, maybe even conceptually, to understand how we will probe that. Thank you. <clears throat>